All right, everybody, welcome. If you're here for the imaging in 50 plus locations, you're in the right spot. If not, I'm so sorry, I'm not gonna let you leave. <laughs> My name is Chase Thompson-Baugh. I'm the division senior technician with uh, GameStop Technology Brands, which is a division of GameStop that owns an Apple authorized reseller, Simply Mac, also owns an AT&T reseller, uh, Spring Mobile, as well as Cricket Wireless. Outside of the big box stores like, say, Best Buy, Simply Mac is the largest Apple specialist and service center in North America. We have 52 stores across the United States. Today, this is an intermediate session, so I am going to make a couple of assumptions about my audience, and I apologize if they're not true. But if you have some basic knowledge about NetBoot, Net Install, Net Restore, if your organization has a registered domain name, like a .com or a .net, that's good. If you have an SSL or TLS certificate provider, whether that be some, something free like Let's Encrypt, or if you use a paid service like DigiCert, which is my preferred. Also, if you know what the Django web framework is, or have some basic understanding of how a web server works, um, that will help you. If not, do not worry. I will provide links and code and the slides all at the very end, okay? and you are very welcome to contact me and I'll have my information. Okay, I'm gonna address the elephant in the room here. This is a session about imaging, right? That means that we use NetBoot, NetInstall, ASR-like tools uh, to restore an operating system or update an operating system on a computer's hard drive. But imaging is supposed to be dead, right? That's all I've heard this week. I recently saw this image in the Mac Admin Slack group, and anytime I hear anything about imaging being dead, all I can think of is this. <sighs> now, the reasons that people give that imaging being dead is that uh, Apple has poured a lot of resources into their device enrollment program. Uh, with DEP, you shouldn't need to image a brand new computer. You shouldn't need to netboot or use ASR-like tools. Mobile device management and the volume purchase program also take the hassle out of touching every single computer. And this sounds really great on paper unless you're like me and you work for an Apple authorized service center. Since January, Simply Mac has seen over 10,000 computers come through our doors, unique computers. We've run imaging workflows on 8,500 of them. These are all customer owned devices. We do not own any of them. Do you wanna know how many we can use DEP on? None. For us, imaging can't be dead. We need it in some form. This is, not a man this is not a matter of managing computers. This is a matter of repairing computers, and we can't manage them in any form. Now, I know that uh, some of the tools that I'm going to talk about today are not really compatible with High Sierra right now, and High Sierra may break some of the things that we're doing, but I do know that Apple's own physical retail stores do use imaging on their customer computers as well. I know that Apple says that they plan to support uh, APFS in the ASR tool at some point, and that still may not be enough to really resurrect what we're doing, but that's just a bridge we're gonna have to cross when we come to it. High Sierra is still in beta. Apple has also said that they plan to continue supporting the system image utility for creating NetBoot, NetInstall, and NetRestore images. So speaking of NetBoot, I'm gonna start by explaining some of the challenges that Simply Mac has had with NetBoot last year. If you walked into any one of our stores and tried to option boot on our network, you might see something like this. <laughs> Since we have to support a wide range of Mac computer models, that also meant that I had to have at least a net install, a net restore, and sometimes a net boot for every operating system version that comes through our doors. Uh, for instance, if we replaced your computer's hard drive, under warranty, we are required by Apple to put the same operating system back on that drive as originally shipped with the computer. That policy is a little bit more lax since the operating system has been free for a number of years now, but let's say your computer doesn't support the latest operating system. It means that I have to have on hand the, the last operating system that your hardware supports. That means potentially three netboots per OS, and we support 10.7 and up, okay? So option booting in one of our stores got really quickly out of hand because with close to 25 different NBI files on our servers, uh, plus Apple Service Toolkit, which is another couple of NBI files, the chances of you selecting the wrong one and just blindly erasing a customer's data 
was a little too high for comfort. So at this quantity, you can barely even read the labels, which I don't have in the slide, but they're really, really tiny. Also, we had the challenge of actually keeping 52 stores in sync with the exact same set of NBIs. If Apple released a new version of their operating system, we had to get it to our stores like next day because customers are going to need it. So we needed this to be automated in some fashion. And for a time, our department was syncing to each server using Dropbox and using folder actions with a custom shell script to then copy, not move, copy the NBI files into the netboot directory. Couldn't move them because then Dropbox would say, well, that file doesn't exist anymore and I'm going to tell all the other servers that it doesn't exist anymore. And if they didn't get it, they're SOL. Later, we tried to use BitTorrent Sync for that as well, but the problem was is that, number one, we would now have two copies of relatively 25 NBI files on our servers, ranging anywhere from two gigabytes to even up to 30 sometimes. Eats up your free space like crazy. So we can't have that. Um, also, we found that the images were getting corrupted because the syncing services would very oftentimes run into conflicts across the different servers. So that is also not very reliable. Don't do this, okay? A lot of times when those images would get corrupted, we would have to upload those images to Amazon S3 and then pull them down on the local servers, which then takes the point out of automation. So around October, um, I got handed the job of managing all the NBIs of last year. So I decided that I was going to be smart about this. We have Meraki security appliances in every single one of our stores, which means that all of our stores have a site-to-site -site VPN connection from my main office. So I wrote this bash script, and I won't go too far into it. I'll provide it later on if you're curious. Um, but basically what it does is it takes the master directory of NBI files on my Mac Pro, and it uses rsync across the VPN to each store's local server. And then it took advantage of the GNU parallel command so that it could perform multiple syncs at once. And this worked a bit better, um, but it still introduced issues of image corruption. If the command got interrupted at any point, then that store wouldn't get the proper files. Also, a few of our stores have poor internet connection. Uh, we're working on that, but um, some of them are just not very great because they're in malls where such isn't offered. Um, which might mean that the site-to-site -site connection is not trustworthy at all. And some of them didn't even work with site-to-site -site because of an ISP problem, so we had to use S3 with them anyway. So in November of last year, I went ahead and I reached out to the Mac Enterprise mailing community. This is similar to Slack, but it uses traditional email and Google Groups. Um, and I presented our situation. Now, what I would really love is for Apple to create a configurator-like situation, like what they've done with iOS. I'd love it if I could take an Apple-approved tool, netboot into it, get a menu where I can apply a blueprint and say, I want to restore 10.7, or I want to upgrade this computer up to the latest version of 10.12. This would be excellent, but it doesn't exist. So the community managed to steer me toward using an open source product called Imager, as well as um, using Amazon's uh, resources a little bit more thoroughly, because we already have a presence there. For those of you who don't know, Imager is an open source deployment and imaging tool. Now, while this is not going to be an in-depth tutorial on how to set up Imager specifically, I'll briefly explain how it works for context. Imager is just an application that runs on Mac OS. It reads a configuration file that lives on a web server somewhere, and it contains workflows for imaging computers. These workflows describe imaging, package installation, and script tasks to run on a machine. It pulls those files down from a different web server, or it could be the same web server as your config file, um, and then it runs them on the target volume. Right here is a sample of what the imager configuration plist looks like just uses XML formatting. In this sample, we have a workflow called 10.12 Sierra Restore that will image a computer with the DMG listed in that URL uh, on a target drive. You may notice the uh, bracket bracket server underscore URL bracket bracket. I'm not trying to obfuscate our server's URLs. That actually has a function in our uh, P list, and I'll explain about that in a minute. Imager provides us that simple menu with all of our images and installers that we need. Each workflow is clearly labeled, 
and has notes that also describe exactly what it's going to do down to build numbers. Since each workflow basically re represents the function of an MBI, we can now go from this mess to something that looks a little bit more like this. Much cleaner, much more legible. And of course we need, uh, or excuse me, we would prefer to still only have one netboot, but we need to support older hardware, right? So we started off with 10.10, which is a netboot that has Imager, as well as all of our service software. 10.12 is no different, except for the fact that uh, Apple introduced this really fun framework called System Integrity Protection. Um, <laughs> they started including it on Mac OS 10.11, and unfortunately, it prevents us from using the BLESS tool to set the startup disk. And the upgrade packages that we built really rely on that. However, System integrity protection is not present in a net install environment. It is present in net boot, but not net install. So we use two different tools, one that helps us to create some net boots and one that helps us to create a net install just containing imager so that we can get around system integrity protection. Still, three is better than 25. So since we decided to go this route, we had to set up imager server or imager on a Mac OS server. Why Mac OS server? Why not Linux or something more enterprise-y that we hear about? Well, all of our stores already have a Mac OS server. We're already running Apple Service Toolkit in every single store, which requires Mac OS server. So we just use this. This right here is the default directory um, for the web server on Mac OS. And so we created an imager directory, and that's where our imager repository will live on all the local servers. Our imager repository contains five basic directories. Imager doesn't care how you organize things as long as it has valid URLs. So just go ahead and set up however you want. But this is how we chose to do it. After setting up the repository, we had to enable the websites option and then just make sure it was working. That's pretty much it. If you have net install service already running on your server, chances are this is already enabled. Lastly, we added the NBI files and made sure that the net install service was working with them. You'll notice there we're even testing 10.13 uh, with this solution. Perks of being a developer. Okay, now Imager works on one server, but I've got to deploy it to 52 locations. So I mentioned that we use Amazon Web Services. We use S3 uh, when we have to. And we're also going to use GitHub and Jamf for this. This flowchart illustrates at a very high level how we deploy Imager's repo and settings to our servers. Very first thing we do is when Apple releases a new operating system update, one of our technicians is going to go ahead and download that software. Then we put that software through its paces with a few different tools. Again, I'm not going to go into depth on each one of these, but I'll have links to them at the very end, OK? So auto damage, if you're not familiar, creates a restorable DMG. So it's like a never booted Mac image. Um, Create OS 10 install package written by Greg Nagel basically takes that Apple installer and makes a package that you can use to install the operating system. We'll probably replace that with the start OS install command that now ships with the Mac installers. Auto Imager NBI helps us to create those net boot environments where we already have Imager and all of our service software. And NBI Creator helps us create that net install with Imager. Lastly, we would update our imager configuration plist with all of the new URLs and descriptions and notes and all that fun stuff. Next thing I do is I push up the configuration to GitHub for version tracking. We have looked at using something like uh, you know, GitLab and GitLFS or GitFat to track changes to the packages and to the images themselves, but it's really just not a big concern for us right now. Next. We're going to go ahead and we're going to take that master repository that we've just updated and we're going to push it up to Amazon S3 using the Amazon uh, command line interface, or CLI. I am going to walk you through how this works, okay? If you are new to Amazon Web Services, I would love for you to get familiar with it because it is a fantastic resource, okay? I am going to assume, one of my more assumptions, is that you already have an account created with Amazon Web Services. There will be a link at the end. If you don't, it will show you exactly how to do it. But we need to create a service user for our Imager account. Now, you can create uh, a number of different service users to do certain tasks. You could also just use your own Amazon Web Services account. There are times when I prefer to use my own rather than a service user because I have elevated permissions. And I'll show you 
at which point uh, I would do that. If you have an account, this is what the, the main AWS console looks like today. The console changes a lot. Uh, my login username has been redacted for obvious reasons. In the search box, you're going to go ahead and type in the letters IAM, which stands for Identity Access Management. Once you're there, you're going to click on Users and add a new user. We're going to set the username of this service user to just imager-demo. We're going to set their access type to programmatic access, meaning they'll not be able to log into the AWS console, but they'll still be able to access our AWS services. Next, we're going to click Add Permissions. Uh, in this stage, I'm actually going to skip adding any permissions, because I'm going to do it later to show you how you would add additional permissions later on. Okay. AWS then warns you, you don't have permissions, you can't do anything. That's okay, just click Create. Once you've created, then you're going to be uh, given the option to download the access key and ID uh, and secret key. Download it. You're never going to get another chance to get this key, ever, because Amazon doesn't have it. They have it in an encrypted form, but they can't give it back to you. So. If you ever lost it, you would go into your imager user or your whatever security user you have, click on security credentials, and it would allow you to create a new access key for this user. You can see there on the right, you can also make inactive the previous key or just delete it altogether, or you can have multiple keys. Amazon doesn't really care. This is what the access key and the secret key look like. It's the top one's just a string of capital letters. The bottom one is alphanumeric with a couple of different symbols. Like I said, store this in a safe place. You're never going to get it from Amazon again, even though you can create another. OK, we have a service user. Let's create an S3 bucket to host our imager repository. From the AWS console, we're going to go into S3. I think it stands for like simple secure storage. They have fun acronyms. Uh, the S3 page looks like this. You're going to click Create a Bucket, and you'll give that bucket a unique name. Now, if you're not familiar with the term bucket, it's just a file share. It's just a location to store files. Okay? Bucket names become part of the DNS name that Amazon uses to route to it. So all bucket names must be unique, not just for your organization. If I have imager-assets-demo, none of you can have it, period. They are unique across the globe. Okay? You'll pick a region in which you want to host the bucket. S3 buckets aren't necessarily tied to a region, but certain regions have different pricing on different buckets. So I recommend you just look at the S3 page to look at different pricing. Okay? Uh, I usually deploy things into North Virginia or Oregon, just because. Okay? Then you'll click Next. Now we've got an empty S3 bucket called imager-assets-demo that our service user still cannot use. Let's fix that. Go back to Identity Access Management click on Policies, and then click Create Policy. You have a few options here, sorry. You have a few options here, um, but I selected the Policy Generator because it's the best compromise of automation and choice. We're going to set the effect of this policy to Allow, set the AWS service to S3, and we're going to select four actions. It was really hard to capture those actions in a, sc in a screenshot, so here they are. List allows your user to see what's in a bucket. Get allows them to download whatever they see. Put allows them to put new objects in the bucket. And delete allows them to delete the objects that they see, but not the bucket itself. Okay? So it basically grants them some you know, rudimentary read-write access to the bucket's contents. So then you're going to set the Amazon resource name. So we've already told it it's going to be in AWS. We just have to tell it what thing in AWS. So the resource name usually starts with ANR, colon, AWS, colon, whatever service, and then three colons, and the specific item name. In this case, imager assets demo. Click uh, add statement, which will apply those settings down below, and then we click next step. So this is where we name our policy. We're just going to call it imager assets demo. We'll give it a basic description so that uh, we know what it's doing. In the policy document, um, I know you can't see that, so here it is. Basically, it does the exact same things that we did before. It sets the effect to allow. The action is S3, and what are those things that S3 can do? And then it has the resource name. At this point, definitely click Validate Policy to make sure that it's good. This policy is valid, so we're going to go ahead and just create it. Now we can go back to our users in IAM. 
select our image or demo user. We're going to go to our permissions. This time we are going to attach an existing policy because we actually have one created. In the search field, look for the policy name you assign to the policy and check the box when it comes up. And then just click Next Review. We should see a managed policy with the correct name and click Add Permissions. Our imager user can now talk to the bucket. So let's use that to push our repository up to S3. Uh, Amazon provides a command line interface, or a CLI, that does checksumming on all the files, and it also sends them in chunks. So it doesn't try to a continuous stream of, say, 8 gigabytes. It breaks it up into smaller files. So it's very forgiving on uh, connection interruptions or with slow internet connections, which is fantastic. That's solving some of our other problems. First, we need to install the AWS CLI. It's three commands in the terminal. Basically, you download it using curl, you unzip it, and you run the install script. Okay? Again, this will be provided at the end. Or you can just use Homebrew if you're a Homebrew user. I know some people are a more Mac ports user. I'm not going to get into the uh, differences between the two or the religious fight against them. Um, but I couldn't find a ports uh, command to get it installed, so this is what you get. So those credentials that we just created, like the, uh, the access key and the secret, those need to be stored as environment variables for the AWS CLI to use them. The best way to do this is just to edit your, your Bash profile. Again, we're not getting, gonna get into the philosophical or religious debates between Nano and Vim and Emacs. Uh, just edit your Bash profile however you want. Somewhere in the profile, it can be at the top, bottom, middle, doesn't care. Um, go ahead and type this in. Substitute, of course, the access key and the secret key for the values of your service user or your own IAM credentials, which again, we'll come back to that. Go ahead and save the file. Load the file. If you don't want to quit the terminal session, just source your bash profile or quit terminal and open up a new window and they will load as environment variables. We're finally ready to sync to S3 now, guys. Aren't you excited? Okay, so the very first part of this uh, command is we call the AWS CLI, tell it that we're working with S3 and we want the sync operation. First, we give it the master path or the master set of files that are going to go up to S3. Then we give it the destination within S3, which in this case is just S3 colon slash slash the bucket name. And I also put my repository in a directory in the bucket. It makes it uh, capable of using this bucket for other things. So I put the repository in a repo directory. I put the NBIs in an NBI directory. I don't want to send any DS store files from my Mac. That's pointless. So I exclude them. And I also tell it that, hey, I have a master. So if there's anything in the destination that doesn't exist in my master anymore, get rid of it. Typing that command out every time can be a bit of a bear. So I also go back to my bash profile and I set up alias commands. This is a way for you to take a really long, complex command that you use all the time and shorten it to something really small, okay? I have it for both the NBI and the repository. So now I just run this in terminal. The, des or the directory on my local machine where I store the repo and the NBI is never changes. So I never have to update this. It's fantastic. Okay. So now the files are in S3, and we need a trigger to send those files over to our servers on a continual basis. Simply Mac is already a Jamf customer, so it makes sense to use Jamf for this. So we're going to create some Jamf policies for this. Um, don't worry if you don't have Jamf, OK? First thing I'm going to show you is the script that Jamf is actually running. And this is more universal. You can use it with a lot of different things. This is just a shell script, and I define some basic variables, uh, the AWS access key and the secret. I also tell it the region in which the bucket is in. I tell it where to find the AWS binary on my server. I tell it where I want to put my stuff on the server, and then I also pass the bucket URL as a variable as well. That's what the dollar sign four, five, and six are. They're parameters that I will then pass to my script. Jamf helps me do that. You could also hard code them if you want. I don't like that, though, because if I have to change up my access credentials, which I recommend you do uh, on a continual basis, um, it's harder to just go back and update the script. Um, it's easier if you can just pass them as variables in your management solution. OK. 
Okay, this next part was heavily influenced by some of Rich Troughton's scripts. He puts them all on GitHub, and it's amazing. Um, but what I do is I verify that the AWS CLI is, in fact, installed on the server. If it's not, I install it using those same three commands that you saw earlier. If, I, if it's still not found on the server after it's been installed, I just exit because there's no point in continuing. Next, AWS CLI still needs those credentials as environment variables, so I export them in the script, and then I sync the imager repository. I'm just doing the same command in reverse. The destination is now the source, source is the destination. S3 is the master, and then we push down. Again, we're telling it, delete all the old junk if it doesn't exist anymore. I'm also passing a quiet flag so that my Jamf logs are nice and small. Otherwise, I'll get a line for every single chunk passed to the server. Lastly, uh, I need to update the configuration plist for imager. Um, you remember that uh, server underscore URL thing that I showed you before, and I said that there's a reason for that? Here's why. None of our stores have the same IP address for their servers. They're all on different subnets. We're working on getting them on a template, but that's still going to be a couple months out, and I needed a solution you know, yesterday. So what we do is we use an open source product called Factor, which can collect information about your computer. You just call it up and tell it what you want, and it'll spit it out. So we grab the IP address of the server during this run, and then we go ahead and we replace every instance of bracket bracket server URL, and we replace it with the IP address of the server. So now it's up to date every single time. So no matter what changes, uh, from day to day, the configuration plist will always be one of those changed items in the log because it will always update the IP address. Also helpful if you don't have static IP addresses, which you should. It's a server. Come on. And then lastly, we run all of those uh, functions. Okay? Again, if you don't have Jamf, that's fine. I am going to show you the policies. I'm just not going to go into too much depth on how I created them. But suffice it to say that I made one for syncing imager, uh, the NBIs, and the repo. Okay. We have this uh, s policy running on recurring check-in, basically meaning that every time the computer makes a connection to Jamf, it tries to run the policy. It can only run one time a day, and it only runs during off hours at the store, so that we're not eating up valuable bandwidth when customers are present. Right here, you can see uh, on the left, we go over to where the script is being called, and then we pass in those variables there in those first three boxes for the key, the ID, uh, secret key, and uh, the bucket URL. If you don't have Jamf, use a launch daemon for this, okay? There's lots of resources on how to create launch daemons that are timed and that they'll just continuously run. You could probably even just make a monkey package to do this, or if you have Puppet and Chef, you could make a recipe or a manifest for that. Um, but in my personal opinion, and I'm entitled to my personal opinion, Jamf is the perfect tool for this. Because it reliably executes the scripts, I can set it to a schedule, it sends log data, and I don't have to hard code the, the variables in the script itself. Okay? You just got Jamfed. Now the server is up to date with the latest imager repository and the NBI files. If I push a new version up to S3, I'm confident that our servers will have it the very next morning. And this has been very proven. Our techs can now s begin to service imager, uh, excuse me, service customer computers. But wouldn't it also be nice if we could collect logs on how imager is working in the field? Of course it would. Imager can send reports of every single thing that it's doing to a reporting server. The author of Imager, Graham Gilbert, wrote that in. So that's where Imager Server comes in. We're going to be setting up Imager Server in AWS, and we're going to bounce some notifications to Slack. Okay? Imager Server you can find on Graham Gilbert's GitHub page, and it's a Django web application, which all that means is that it's Python code built on a web framework. Okay? That's all Django is. It takes all the, the muss and fuss out of cr standing up your own web server, essentially. Um, so his code is right there. You can see Graham Gilbert, Imager Server. It accepts reports from Imager and then bounces them over to Slack. It can even store all those reports in a database, which my data intelligence and BI guys love. So this is perfect for me. After a brief conversation on the Mac admin Slack group, I learned that I could run Imager 
in AWS Lambda and then store the static files that Imager needs, like say, or Imager server needs rather, like uh, the CSS, the JavaScript, and any images in Amazon S3. Is anybody familiar with Lambda? Okay, we've got one person. This next slide is for all you others, okay? <laughs> I love this. This is from the introduction video on AWS's website. Let me explain what's going on. AWS Lambda is a service that lets you run your own code or somebody else's code, like you know, we get from the open source community, in a serverless environment. With serverless computing, your application still actually runs on a server, but all the server management is done by AWS. So what does this mean to you? It means that you can take an application from the open source world or one that you write, as long as it's in one of the languages that Lambda supports, which are Node.js, Python, Java, and C Sharp, you give that code to Lambda. It reads it and says, I know how to run this. And it creates microservers that are specially designed to serve up your code. You don't have to do anything with Linux, with installing packages. You don't have to worry about software updates. It takes it all for you, okay? It only runs those servers when it receives a request for a few milliseconds. Just enough time to process your request, hand it off to another service if that's what's in your code, and then it kills all those servers. You pay Amazon only for the time that it takes to run that request. It's measured in hundreds of milliseconds. Um, Lambda does have a free tier, too, which allows you one million free requests per month. Since January, Simply Mac has spent a total of seven cents on Lambda. We get reports, hundreds of them, every single day, we've spent seven cents. It's fantastic. So, to get Lambda and Imager server working nicely in a, you know, copacetic way, we use a Python framework called Zappa. It's also open source. If you haven't heard about Zappa, you're hearing about it today. It allows us to take any Python WSG app, like Django or a Flask-based Django app. If anybody was in Bryson Tyrrell's uh, workshop the first day, that Flask-based notification thing that he did, <laughs> it would work with Zappa and AWS too. Zappa takes your code and automatically packages it up sets up a Amazon API Gateway to send all of your requests over to Lambda, and then sets up your code in Lambda for you. This is really amazing stuff, guys, and I'm gonna handhold you through it, okay? To get this working, I had to change a couple of things in Imager Server's code. First, I went into the master settings file for the project, <coughs> and I changed the requirements.txt to include Django-Storages, which is a storage library that allows Django to talk to Amazon S3. I added the PSY COP G2 library, which allows uh, Django to then talk to a PostgreSQL database. And of course, I added Zappa. Zappa on its own will install many other libraries that you need. So this is incredibly handy that you just have to call Zappa and it'll take care of the rest for you. If you love the idea of Imager Server bouncing notifications to Slack, but you don't want to mess with a database, you don't have to. You can just ignore all the PostgreSQL stuff that I'm going to talk about and don't have to modify that at all. Django likes using a database, doesn't need it, okay? So then the next thing I do is I set up a virtual environment. This command, virtual env, basically what it does is it creates a container on your computer where you can install Python, you can install Python packages, and you can run certain code without affecting your operating system's code, okay? If you're not familiar with that, link's at the end, promise. So I create this virtual container and then I change into it. I uh, tell the operating system I'm gonna activate the virtual container so that all my commands are forwarded to it and not to the operating system's Python. I go ahead and I clone my branch of the Imager server, okay? So I did fork Graham Gilbert's branch and I have one that is specifically designed to work with AWS. You can go ahead and just grab it, I don't care. Have it for free. Then I go ahead and I change into it and I run that requirements file that you saw in the previous slide. It installs all the dependent software for me using the Python image packager. Then I run Zappa init. If you're familiar with Git, you run a similar command, git init, to make a directory compatible with Git. We're making this compatible with Zappa. 
This is what it looks like when you run Zappa in it. It's going to ask you a few questions just to make sure that it's on page with you to set this up with AWS. The first thing that it asks you is, what stage of deployment are you in? Are you in dev, staging, or production? If you use other words, you have to use Lambda's terminology. So just translate it. I'm going to type in dev. It then says, OK, what bucket do you want to use for this? If you don't have a bucket, just type in a name, and I'll make one for you. That's pretty awesome. I'm going to type in imager-assets-demo, because we already have that for the imager repo and NBI. So let's just keep using it. And because everything's compartmentalized into the NBI and the repo directories in the bucket, whatever Zappa does, it's not going to affect anything else that I've done up there. Next, it says, hey, it looks like you're trying to use a Django application. I am. Thank you, Zappa. So it offers to use the project settings. And I'm just going to go ahead and hit Enter. I don't have to do anything there. Um, if you are familiar or would like to deploy your Lambda application uh, into multiple regions around the world for high availability. You could say that you want it to be uh, deployed globally. I really don't recommend this, though. Just deploy in one region unless you really know what you're doing. So I'm going to push N and type Enter. The next thing that Zappa does is it confirms. It says, OK, based on what you've told me, I'm going to make a file that will define the Zappa deployment, and it's going to look like this. So it has some JSON there. And it's going to put it in the master, uh, or excuse me, the root directory of Imager. And I say that looks just fine. The next thing Zappa tells me is, you're done. I can go ahead and deploy this up to AWS right now for you, if you just type in Zappa deploy dev. Hold off on that, though, because um, there's a couple things that I'd rather change. Um, in the Zappa underscore settings.json file that it just generated for me, I recommend adding a couple of more keys. One for domain, so that we can tell it what domain this is going to be running on. And this is where having a registered domain comes into play. You need to have a registered domain. They're pretty free, almost. Almost. Uh, GoDaddy or even Amazon Web Services has its own domain registrar. It's called Route 53. It's a little bit more expensive, but just get a registered domain. Uh, Lambda description helps you to identify this once it's up in AWS. And project name will also help you to tag things a little bit better so that you can see uh, billing options. Okay. And also, I want it up in a database. So I'm going to use Amazon's relational database service. And I also want Django to be able to talk to S3. I've installed the library for it, but it still doesn't know how to talk. Let me show you S3 first. Uh, what I needed to do to get this working is I needed to go into the Django master settings file, settings.py, and I added the storages library to the list of installed applications so that Django can directly interact with the storages library. Then at the bottom of that file, really anywhere in it, doesn't matter, uh, I went ahead and I gave it the credentials for my IAM service user. This user already has access to that bucket, so it makes sense to continue using it. Uh, I also gave it the bucket name. As you can see here, it formats that bucket name into a whatever your bucket name is, s3.amazonaws.com. This is why you have to have unique names. Otherwise, this would collide with somebody else's, and Amazon doesn't allow you to do that. OK, once that file is saved, we can go ahead and we can call this command that tells Django, grab all those static resources like CSS, JavaScript, images, and go ahead and cache them for anybody else who wants to have them. And in this case, it's going to put them in S3 for us, OK? Because we've already set that up. The next thing I want to do is I want to set up the database. So back in that same settings.py file, there is a section for a database. The first thing that I changed is I changed the engine name so that it's using that uh, PostgreSQL engine that I installed before, OK? Um, now I need to set up a database inside of Amazon. This is ridiculously simple, guys. You go back to the AWS console. In that search field, you're going to type in RDS for a relational database service, and it will drop you right here. There is a free tier for databases. So I'm just going to check that box, click on PostgreSQL, and then hit Select. You'll see there on the left that if you come out of the free tier, this is about how much the settings for this database will cost. It's still pretty darn cheap at $13 a month. 
uh, I'm going to ignore this for now because I'm only showing the options for the free tier. Unless you know what you're doing with PostgreSQL, I'd probably just leave these settings alone. So I'm going to scroll down. Right here, you give the database an, um, an instance identifier. Now, this is not the database name that you will eventually pass to Django. This is just to help you identify this instance in the AWS console. You can have multiple databases per instance, just like a regular SQL server. Go ahead and set up a master username, a master password, and then click Next Step. Uh, personally, I would recommend setting up a really long master password. I usually just open up one password, have it generate a random blob of like 50 characters, and then just <laughs> drop that right in. Okay? And then I already have it stored in one password for easy recollection. Okay. Now, even though this is, a, this is an intermediate session, there are some things that are still out of scope for this. Virtual private cloud, or VPC, is Amazon's term for setting up basically networking within your AWS resources. Um, ideally, you would want to have your Lambda function and your RDS server in the same virtual private cloud, the same way that you would do at your work office. You would have things on similar subnets so that they could talk to each other, right? This would also mean that your RDS instance could be isolated from the public internet. Nobody can get to it except your Lambda function, which would increase security. But that is outside the scope of this lesson or this uh, session and it would take way too long to go over VPCs and subnets and route tables and all of that. So, for the purposes of this dev instance, we're going to leave VPC, subnet group, publicly accessible, and availability zone all at their defaults. VPC security group is normally uh, selected on create new security group, which just leaves the PostgreSQL port of 5432 open to the world. Okay. I had one that already did that, so I selected it. But normally, you would just leave all of these five options alone, OK? Next, we're going to set up a database name. This is our very first database that RDS will initialize for us. This is the thing that we will pass to Django. So I'm just going to call it Imager. I'm going to leave the rest of those parameters alone. You can set up backup retention, where it will back up your RDS uh, automatically, and uh, you can specify how long you want to keep those backups. The default is fine with me. I do not recommend setting up enhanced monitoring for this instance. One, why? It's just imager reports. You do really don't need that. It's not resource intensive. Um, but if you do plan to use this RDS instance for more databases or things that require more enhanced monitoring, then you can turn it on. It is an additional cost, though. As far as maintenance, just leave that alone. Let Amazon figure it out. Because again, this database is mostly just for running some simple queries, history data, nothing live, and it's not mission critical. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and launch that database. So then you'll see this. Your database instance is being created. We're going to view our database instance. And after about 10 or 15 minutes, RDS will have uh, provided you with the endpoint URL so that you can tell your application, your SQL Explorer, or anybody else how to get to the database. So I'm going to go back to that settings.py file. I'm going to give it the name of the database, the username, the password. Please don't use sup super secret 10. That's just an example. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody still awake? Good. Uh, we're going to give it the host name or that endpoint URL that RDS just gave us. And we're going to give it the port number of where it can talk to it. We're going to run three commands that tell Django to go ahead and set up that database for us and create a user in the database so that we can log into Imager server when it's deployed. OK? That's all those do. Now we're finally going to deploy our Zappa function up to AWS Lambda and API Gateway. This is so much fun that I made a video. I'm going to type Zappa Deploy Dev. What this does is it goes ahead and it inspects my AWS environment, sets up Zappa roles if they need to be set up. It goes ahead and it downloads any dependencies it needs for Lambda to run my application code properly. It then goes ahead and it packages that all up, stores it on S3 for temporary storage, sets up the API gateway so that it we can get requests to it. API gateway then forwards those over to our Lambda function, which Zappa will set up for us, and at the end, it gives us the endpoint for API Gateway. That's it. You really don't need to do much else. Um, 
You can see there we've got the URL for our API gateway endpoint. I did create this using the uh, AWS access key and secret key of my own personal AWS account because our service user doesn't have permissions to talk to API Gateway or Lambda or set up roles. Uh, you can go back to IAM and set up policies so that your service user can talk to it, but your account probably has elevated permissions and it makes more sense that you are pushing something to Lambda, not your service user. So I went back to my Bash profile and I swapped out my credentials, okay? And then I was able to run this. If you go into the AWS console, type in Lambda, you'll be dropped right here. And you can see there's our imager-server and then the environment-dev. I don't have to do a single thing extra here in Lambda to get this to work. I'm gonna leave it alone. I'm gonna go over now to API Gateway. So this is what the page for API Gateway looks uh, look like. You can see that imager-server-dev is our new API endpoint. I'm gonna select that, click on stages on the left, click the dev stage, and look, there's the same URL that Zappa gave us. So it's all working. However, if you did try to go to that in the browser because it has that slash dev at the end of it, you're gonna get this. 403 forbidden. What's actually happening here is that Django is misinterpreting the slash dev and then trying to execute it in the login screen, which API Gateway says you can't do that and it's blocking it. So what we need to do is we need to get that slash dev off of the URL. And to do this, we need a custom domain name. So this is where my assumptions come in. I assume that you have a registered domain name so that you can create a subdomain, okay? I assume you know how to create a CNAME record for that subdomain in your DNS registrar. Links for it will be at the end if you don't. But there are lots of different types of DNS registrars, lots of different uh, hosters between like GoDaddy or Hover or even AWS that it was just too big of a topic to cover in like five minutes. Let's assume you've already got that. We're gonna go back to API Gateway. We're gonna click on custom domain names and create a new custom domain name. This is where you're gonna tell AWS uh, the domain name and uh, set it up for your API environment. Here's a caveat though. API Gateway only sets things up uh, over SSL and TLS. It will not allow you to talk to your API insecurely, which is really good. But it also means that if we're using a custom domain name, we now need, need an SSL certificate to be able to work with that custom domain name or our browsers will reject it. Luckily, Amazon has a really cool service called Certificate Manager that can help out with that. Here's another one of my assumptions. I assume you have an SSL provider, whether that be Let's Encrypt or a paid service like DigiCert, you need to get an SSL certificate for this domain that you just created, okay? Let's suppose that the domain that I'm going to create is imager-demo.simplymac.com, okay? I would go and I would get a signed certificate for that domain. I would then receive back a public key signed by my registrar. I would have a private key that I used initially to create my signing request, and I would have the trust chain certificate from either Let's Encrypt or DigiCert or whomever you use. You need those three. In the AWS console, you're gonna go to Certificate Manager, and it'll look something like this. You'll notice that I have an arrow pointing to what region uh, of AWS you are in. While you can use Certificate Manager in any region you want, you can only use it with API Gateway if your certificate lives in the North Virginia region. Why? I'm sure there's a really good reason, but I don't know what it is. I tried to look it up and find it. It really doesn't matter. As long as you're in the North Virginia region for this part, it'll work. So I'm in North Virginia. I'm going to click Import Certificate. And this is where you put in uh, those three things that I told you earlier. Your public key, the signed certificate goes in the, certi the certificate body. Your private key that you use to create the signing request goes in the private key box. And the trust chain that you get back from your registrar also goes, or your uh, certificate provider, that is, goes in the certificate chain. And then you're gonna click Review and Import. It'll just show you the same three boxes and say, okay. So I did that, and I'm gonna go ahead now, back in API Gateway, I'm gonna tell it that my API's new domain name is going to be imager-demo.simplymac.com. 
I'm going to pass it my certificate that I generated from DigiCert. In the base path mappings, I'm just going to put a forward slash for the path because I'm, I'm telling the API, don't add anything additional after this. This is just going to be a slash right here, the root. I give it the API right there for destination, and I specify the stage that I'm in, which right now is dev. If you did deploy additional stages, like uh, staging or prod, you can always go back and just change this for the custom domain name. You don't have to set up new domain names for each stage. Just change it to be what stage you're on. Then click Save. After about 10 or 15 minutes, AWS is going to give you a CloudFront URL for this uh, new domain name. So basically, you now need to take your domain name, in this case, imager-demo.simplymac.com. I would go to my domain registrar, and I would set up a CNAME record that then points that to the CloudFront URL anytime somebody tries to access imager-demo. Okay? Again, there's lots of different registrars out there, and they all have their own documentation on how to do this. So I apologize that I can't do it in the time allotted to show you how to do that. But yeah, there's lots of information out there on how to do it. Okay? So now that we've set this all up, we've got the cert SSL certificate installed. We're using a custom domain name in API Gateway. Let's go ahead and try and hit that in a browser. Much better. This is exactly what we wanted to see. Now, if you don't have a database set up, you're not going to be able to log in because you haven't created a super user for it to know about. But that's OK. You don't need it for the Slack notifications to work. Speaking of Slack, we have yet to actually set that up. So let's go back to the Django settings file. You'll see these lines in the file. Just go ahead and edit them to your preferences. You do want Slack notifications. Your webhook URL you'll get from the Slack uh, channel documentation. And then um, you can put in that channel's name and what you want the bot to be called. You know how when you're on Slack, it says your username and then your message? If you want that username to say something else, you can tell it what the bot name should be. I just use Imager. Makes sense to me. If you've already deployed your Zappa function into Lambda, just call the update from Zappa at this point. It will go ahead and repackage up your code, make sure that it doesn't need any new dependencies, ensure that API Gateway and Lambda are still there, and then it just updates what it needs to. All the hassles taken out of the actual deployment. Zappa's doing everything for you. This is what it looks like in Slack. Every time Imager runs, you're going to get a message that looks like this. You can see this is a computer that was preparing to run the 10.12 Sierra Restore. I also have the serial number, which I kind of blanked out for obvious reasons, and what status it's in. These are the steps that it took to actually run that workflow. And this is the message of that workflow successfully completing. If you use Graham's branch, the imager notifications are not quite this nice. I formatted them differently for my branch. So that green line there that you see on the, the uh, left, it will be green if everything's OK. It will go red if there's a problem. So at a glance, you can see exactly what's going on. If I've still got you, let's go ahead and let's quickly recap, OK? Simply Mac needed a much better way to image computers. Like I said, since January, we've seen over 10,000 of them. And this has become a question of physical real estate to dollars. If I have a machine sitting on my bench, that is costing me money, OK? So I need a quick way to get it off that bench and back into the customer's hands. If it's, it's there too long, I can't process computers. Some of our stores are processing over 100 computers a day. So this is an important thing. We need a way to image them in a timely manner, whether that be an OS restore or an OS update. We need to get those computers taken care of. We can't use DEP. We don't own them. In fact, Apple prevented Simply Mac from getting a DEP account for over a year after it launched just for the potential that we could have put it on a customer's computer. We really can't do this, guys. So we wanted a simple menu that replaced all these 25 or even more with 10.13 coming out uh, NBI files. So Imager, it's open source, it's free, it gives us everything that we wanted from uh, our NBIs. So with a lot of help from the community, the Mac Enterprise mailing list, the Mac Admin Slack group, and much Googling, we settled on Imager. We deployed it to our servers. We keep the configurations in uh, S3 
uh, along with the repository and the NBI. We track those configuration changes in Git. We are also using Jamf to trigger our, our macOS servers to go up to S3 and pull down new changes. And again, I'm confident that if I pushed changes tonight, every single store would have them in the morning. And that's incredibly powerful. We do use macOS servers. You don't have to use macOS servers for Imager. You can use any web server. Imager doesn't care as long as it's accessible over a URL. With Zappa integration, we deployed Imager server so that we can get logging on how it's performing in 52 locations. Um, we deployed that up into AWS Lambda to actually run the code. And again, microservers, it's only cost us seven cents. API Gateway handles all the requests from the web and forwards them to Lambda. We then store that information in RDS. Um, it pulls all of its static resources from S3 as well. And with Certificate Manager, we can make sure that we have a secured communication. We also have Slack notifications from all of this. Would you like to know how much all the rest of this has cost us since January? Five bucks. Not kidding. I had my <coughs> manager pull the, pull the numbers. S3 data transfer out is uh, a little bit more expensive in some cases, but we are personally on a tier where the data transfer out from S3 uh, for Imager is just minuscule. So it's probably only another like $12. I think we pay a total of 50 bucks and we have probably around, I wanna say 600 gigabytes worth of data in S3 that we're transferring all the time. And so Imager is a really small portion of that um, so it's probably only around another maybe two to three dollars for the S3. This has saved us a ton of time, guys. It's allowed me to be very nimble in supporting Apple's changes in our stores. Uh, it allows our service departments to get those computers off the bench in a timely fashion. And I always get alerts in Slack if there's a problem with Imager. So if a push for some reason didn't work properly, which has happened, then I get those alerts that Imager is not working and I can contact the store usually before they can even submit a ticket. And as you can imagine, this has significantly reduced all of the tickets that we get around Netboot and imaging computers and it has really saved my sanity. So the next time that somebody tells you that imaging is dead, you can tell them that Chase told you there's a big difference between being the only tool that a Mac, or, uh, Mac authorized service center can use on thousands of computers a year and all dead. With that, I'd like to open up the floor to questions if there be any. And remember that we'll get the catch box so that uh, we can get your question on the recording. Does anybody have a question? Okay. So we've got one over here. Thank you. <coughs> okay, so as somebody who has set up Lambda Functions and API Gateway without Zappa, that uh -huh. was really awesome. Yeah, <laughs> right? Uh, two, could you set up a larger application in that that was web-based on Django like Sal? Yes, because Sal is using all of the same things. It's a Django application. It does have libraries and dependencies, and it uses a database. Um, Sal's in internal API integration is still based on just requests coming to it, right? So API Gateway forwards all those requests. Lambda only needs to run for the time to actually serve up those requests. Now, inside of Sal, you, when you're on the dashboard, you have Ajax constantly going back and forth to do updates of like your graphs and your uh, little menulets. I forget exactly, plugins. That's what Graham called them. Um, that will still sends something to API Gateway, sends it to Lambda, which will spin up some microservers. So you might have a little bit more compute time for sure. Uh, right now, uh, when I get back to the office, I have to continue working on an application that talks to app the AppleCare API, which will then automatically enroll all AppleCare purchases uh, from our stores. It queries our uh, point of sale database, pulls that data in, and then uh, enrolls them with Apple's API and then dumps it all into to a database. This is something that's going to use probably a pretty good amount of compute time because it's going to be on all the time. I'm still deploying that to Lambda. All right, so one other question before I pass this on. Sorry. Yeah, sure. um, 
So the big reason I haven't set up netboot in my environment is that it has to be on a single subnet, right? So I, is that still true with Imager? So the Imager application could actually just be run on a normal computer as long as the target volume was connected to it in some fashion. So Imager is kind of bound to the problems that Netboot has, which is why some people say that Netboot and imaging is dead because Netboot has some issues. Uh, that being said, if your hardware supports it, you can do layer three routing on your switches and allow Netboot to talk to different subnets. Um, but typically, yes, your computers that are netbooting will need to be on the same subnet as your macOS server. Now, you could have different servers. Um, you could even use BSD Pi, which replicates the netboot um, service, which is an open source thing. So you could have Linux servers in different subnets, which gets you off of using macOS. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I got some other things. I'll come chat with you later. Okay, sounds good. Anybody else have a question? about AWS in general, or Imager, or Netboot. So do you throttle the transmission of the files, or you just do it all off ORX? Throttle the transmission? When you, like when you copy the files down from to the stores? No, nope, we don't throttle. But you do it all when the stores are closed? But we do it all when the stores are closed, so the servers are pretty much allowed to do whatever they want with the bandwidth. And that's why we only do it at night partially because of bandwidth and partially because we don't want to be updating images when somebody could be potentially using them. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so right here is the URL to have. It's a GitHub repository. It has all of my code examples as links to my AWS branch of Imager server and links to all the other services, software, and such that I talked about today, okay? I will probably keep updating this too. Um, as new things come out or as changes happen, I'm just gonna keep updating this. It also has a, P a PDF copy of all of my slides in case you're interested in those, okay? If you didn't ask a question today, you're not gonna uh, offend me. I will be up here to answer any additional questions or anything else that you wanna tell me about. But I'm on Twitter, I'm on the Mac Admin Slack and there's a feedback URL for this session. I would love to hear from you guys. Seriously, bug me, I don't care. I love finding creative ways to help people out. And this definitely was one of those creative things that has helped us out a ton. And with that, thank you all for coming.